first. And this is silly, but um, so my dad was always just the toughest guy to me. I was just always in awe of just how tough he was. Just, uh, you know, like I just really looked up to him as the real deal. And one of the, one of the memories that solidified that in my mind is when they were, we were, they were living on 90th and I was visiting for Christmas. And uh, so this was in Sandy, and it was just cold and snowy outside, and he would get up and run in the mornings when everybody else was just, you know, snuggled down inside. And I remember, and he would have his beard all grown, and, and he came in one morning, and he, he said, look, Marge, and he had icicle sweat. He's like kind of a little bit of yellowish clear tinge, <laughs> perfect three icicles just hanging from his beard. And, and I just knew that he was just tough as a yeti, you know? And so that's, that's one of my, my favorite memories of that. <laughs> it was when it came to his faith, he was a softie. And um, he, always, he always wasn't afraid to share with us his faith. And he, as a young teenager, I remember him telling us the story about how he gave his own testimony of Joseph Smith and how it was something that he remained with him the rest of his life. They could never doubt that. And um, and so what, you'll have to have him tell the specific details of that story, but um, he will defend Joseph Smith to his very end of his, breath, his last breath. He is just so, um, he has very strong testimony. And I remember as children, you know, here's seven young kids and him trying to gather us around and with my mom trying to get us all to come and have family home evening or do our scripture study and the girls would start giggling and then <laughs> we could never quite keep it going. And I just, I think now that I'm a parent and I know what that's like, um, I just admire that he continued to, and they continue to gather us around and be diligent and persistent in that and um, I'm just super grateful for that and and since we've all grown up um, we've had the privilege of actually having him give us his written testimony that he gave as a Christmas present for all of our families and um, I treasure that gift and even last time we were together in July we bore his testimony for all of us to hear and but that's just such a precious thing for me and I'm just 100% grateful and just super grateful for your example, Dad. Love you so much. So, um, one of my favorite memories was when my dad would come home from his weekends of serving the National Guard. He would have the MREs. They were not that great. And he would still share them with us. And he's always been willing to share. Um, he used to buy these candy bars in the boxes. Baby Ruth. Baby Ruth and Paydays, right? Baby Ruth and Butterfingers. And Butterfingers. And he would share with all of us kids. We thought that was pretty special because we didn't get a lot of treats when we were kids. We, <laughs> no one did back then. Anyway, um, but he, uh, one of the things that I really admire about our dad is his advice. He is a good advice giver, and um, he's really good about um, not judging. I'm a great example that way. So, through it all, he loves us, and we know that. Um, and one of the best pieces of advice he gave me was, I was getting ready to go off to basic training. Maybe some of you don't know that, but I went in the military right out of high school. And I was pretty scared. I started getting a little bit nervous as I was getting ready to leave. And uh, I remember him saying, you're gonna have some hard times. It's gonna be hard, but guess what? The sun is always gonna rise the next morning. They can't stop that. And um, I listened to that. That got me through some really tough times. It's like, you know what? They might drop me for a million push-ups, but guess what? The sun is still gonna come up tomorrow. 
So that helped get me through a couple of really tough months. Anyway, so thank you for being a good advice giver. And I love you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how my dad taught me to love Indian ruins and would take us we were standing, we were standing on a, a pathway on one side of the canyon and looking across, and he kept saying, "Can you see the ruins? Can you see the ruins?" And I'm looking and looking, and, and I just couldn't distinguish them. I just thought that those black streaks running down the canyon wall must have been what ruins were <laughs> until I got older. And um, and I just love that he uh, goes exploring and he's still finding new places in San Juan County. Show me something new. I just want to see some, what, where have you been lately? <laughs> and uh, he does his best to take us out and let us see lots of great things. And I've been trying to memorize all those landmarks that Gents mentioned. Um, you know, cheese and raisins, that, that's a place. And uh, Milk Ranch Point, that's a place. And th there's a lot more. Um, I wanted to say, something about music. So we kind of, our mom taught us a lot of music and had us perform and stuff, but you know, when I think about it, my dad gave us a lot of music too. While he was in Okinawa, he went and bought all the latest stuff that was new and cool in the 70s. He got big headphones and stereo equipment and came back to the United States with this setup. And he built a little cabinet that he put the stereo in and in the bottom drawer, you could sit your cassette tapes because you know, eight tracks were now getting old, I think. So he had cassette tapes, and I just want to play you a little. Uh, so he would play this music, and us kids would dance around the living room. So see if this re brings back memories. That's Eno Morricone. <laughs> that one and Fistful of Dollars and Each Allah and other stuff. That um, there's a kind of a hush all over the world. I remember that was on one of the cassette tapes. Lots of good music. He raised some rabbits for a while and he would bring the bunnies into the living room and let them hop around and let us play with them. So that was really fun. He, when Matthew burnt his hand on this grate that was for the furnace to bring up air from the basement, uh, he doctored his hand so carefully. Methylate was the red stuff in the little tube, and he would paint that on everything that went wrong with us, you know, little all our alleys and skin knees. Oh, he's just funny. So, Dad, forgive me for bringing your words back to haunt you. This is what he said to me yesterday when I talked to him on the phone. <laughs> And I just had to write it down while he was talking. I said, how are you doing? What you been up to? And we talked for a second. He's like, oh, my mind is like a hound dog out in the horse pasture, sniffing around at the horse biscuits and going back over the same spots because I forgot what I'd found out. <laughs> <laughs> like, where do you get this stuff, Dad? <laughs> so like lots of dads, uh, Steve hit some home runs and he hit some and he had a lot of strikeouts and a lot of home runs and I only get to have one memory um, uh, there's several several uh, memories of mine uh, concerning dad that have become the canon in, in my family with my wife and I uh, when I in the late 70s I was between six and eight years old we were in the Nampa Auto Parts store there in Blandy uh, we were getting parts for that old 68 Ford pickup black and white one that was beat up and had mismatched tires. And there were two good old boys there in the, in the parts store where we waited for our parts and they started razzing dad about what he did for me. At this time he had moved on from teaching and was working in mental health services. And, um, and it bothered me. And when we left the, the store, I, I asked him, I said, well, why were they giving you a hard time? He said, well, he said that, that you know, um, about 10% of the population can't take care of themselves. And either we do it like Hitler did, kill them all off, or we try to help them. 
and, and that stuck with me because he didn't run, run those men down. He didn't pick on them, he didn't say anything nasty about them. He just explained his thoughts about it. And, and that was a good example of charity to me. And that example has stuck with me all my life. Thank you, Dad. He finally drew out after, after all those years in Blanding, he never drew out from the uh, mule deer hunt. So we had to move to Sandy, I guess, to finally draw out. And he did, we went down there and uh, we, uh, we went hunting that morning and I think he knew I was an inexperienced in four hunter, and that's true. So we separated and within 20 minutes I heard a, the report of a rifle and I knew he'd gotten his prize. It was small, but he took the first thing that was available, I think, right? <laughs> so, anyway, we had that, we had all kinds of free time, and Preston came up to his cabin at Peabine, and we had the unique opportunity to, to drive cattle off of South Mile Point, and uh, what an amazing adventure it was, but how neat it was to see my dad right up ahead with Preston, and see kind of the reincarnation of the younger self uh, riding horseback, and uh, then seeing the sunset as we came home and the trot past the corrals there just north of Bears Ears and, and seeing the sunset over the White Canyon and, and the, the bridges. And it was absolutely a, absolutely a beautiful uh, experience. So I, I remember those kinds of moments with my dad. I, I share that story because uh, during those times he was such a great listener and it was such a unique opportunity to spend that time with him. Uh, he would always listen to my stories about the kids at school that were bugging me and he had extreme patience to just let me get to the end. You know? I would probably interrupt him and offer some kind of uh, not so sage advice, uh, but he would always listen through and then usually tell me something very validating and let me know he was in my shoes before too. And I was just like every day. It's just, you know, knowing you're okay with your hero lets you know you're kind of okay with the world. So, anyway, love you up. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Starting rope. In the year 2006, Dad and I went to hike Mount Timpanogos. We So we set out early and headed up American Fort Canyon. We got to the place that was surely the starting point and began our hike. After about an hour or so of hiking, we realized that we were not on the right trail. That was typical. <laughs> in fact, we hadn't even started in the right place of the canyon. We had gone way too far up the canyon, and now we were only bothering hunters who were trying to, to be stealthy with their bows. So a few days later, we tried again. Fortunately for us, we found the right parking space and set off at zero dark 30, blindly fumbling our way through the pitch black along the trip. After about 45 minutes, we came to a place on the trail that was paved. This was strange. As we got our bearings, we realized that we were not on the trail heading up the mountain. <laughs> Second time in a row, but rather on the trail that traversed the mountains laterally. We ended up on the highway further up the canyon and had to hike back down the highway to where we had started. Now that we had lost over an hour of our hike, Dad somehow still wanted to keep going, so we set off again, this time heading up the right trail. The hike was a long hike. We moved at a good pace, but it was a long, long hike. After about another seven hours, we made our way to the top of the mountain. Dad would have been about 64 years old at the time. We signed the logbook and headed back down the trail. We had made it. I'm sure it was torturous for Dad, but he kept going. I'll never forget that. Dad used to say, the ox is slow, but the earth is patient. Well, we were slow, and the earth was patient, and the mountain waited, and we finally got there. But more importantly, we got back. But what I'm most grateful for was the time he spent with my kids, especially when I wasn't there. Because of him, I felt like my kids were getting the fatherly love they needed, even when I was deployed overseas. Don't laugh. When I get up, you're supposed to close your eyes until I get up. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm overwhelmed, and uh, it's a tremendous thing. I was just thinking about what I could say about branches and roots, and uh, my mind goes back to some tribute that Lyman gave concerning my grandmother, Nielsen, Ed Nielsen's wife. And uh, it rings in my mind almost all the time, or 
time I think about it, I mean, and that, that's so important for the girls and the men also to know about branches and roots. And the roots pull its strength up into the branches and the branches produce offspring. And the family is really all that counts. It's what produces love in our hearts and makes it all worthwhile. I really appreciate everybody that came here tonight and uh, wish you a happy new year. And, uh, I don't really have anything other to say other than I've always had a friend that stuck closer to her brother. And it's a spirit that came into my life at various places, but one that was in seminary with Albert R. Lyman. And, uh, and so you folks just don't know when you're going to make an impression on a person. It just happens and it's wonderful. And you've all had a great impact on me and I, I appreciate it. And, uh, and that the friend that is closer to the brother has sealed it in my soul. And I'm so grateful for that. Anyway, where's the dessert? <laughs>